So flying above our heads right now is a man moving at five miles per second, and he'll circle the globe every 90 minutes, astronaut Scott Kelly. Astronaut Kelly is in the middle of a year-long space mission, the longest ever for a NASA astronaut, to understand the impact of long-term space travel on the human body. And so we're getting samples, DNA, RNA, microbes from him, dropped onto our lab to examine what happens to him and comparing it to his brother, his twin brother here on Earth, Mark Kelly. So we're building essentially a 19 time point profile of everything that happens for the complete molecular portrait before, during, and after space travel. And so we're doing this with NASA to really think about even longer term missions. They want to go to Mars, they want to go even further. But I want to tell you, my favorite thing about this entire project, this grant, this mission, is that almost everyone working on it will not live to see a lot of the results manifest as a benefit for themselves. All of the people working to put people on other planets will likely never see those planets. And this is actually one of my favorite things about people, about humanity, just about us, is that we can plan for hundreds of years, thousands of years. I actually think this is an innate and quintessential part of human beings. And this, is, this actually leads me to ask a really weird job interview question. Every time I have a grad student or a med student or a postdoc interview for the lab, I do, you know, okay, skills and your background, your strengths, your weaknesses. But I always have a really weird last question. I get kind of somber and I say, okay, so tell me what you think how long do humans have, or our evolutionary derivative, how long do we have? And sometimes they'll think, and maybe 100 years, maybe 1,000, a million, a billion years. But my favorite answer, by far, is when someone says, pauses and says, forever. Because that represents the hope that progress in science and medicine and poetry and music will persist and actually overcome terrorism, war, famine, disease, and that we'll actually make it to Mars and maybe live under the light of a new sun. But to do that, we will need some really long-term plans. We'll need thousands of year plans. So I threw together basically a 500-year plan and put it on the lab's website. And then um, after going to the lab, and first no one would talk to me because they all thought maybe they'd be in grad school or med school for 500 years. And I said, no, 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 that's not part of the plan. No, no, no. <clears throat> I want to just have this idea of what do we need to do to really send people to live on other planets? What will it take? And so I crafted essentially uh, a sketch of a 500 plan, so I'd like to walk you through it today. It really comes uh, in three big pieces and revolves around three topics. So it's really all we need to live on other planets. It's really three things. Uh, more knowledge of genomics and biology, beer, and new music, and that's it. And so I'll walk you through them in that order. So first in genomics, the molecular recipe for the synthesis of all of the cells in your body is actually present in the very first cell. And this is true whether you're a cnidarian, or whether you're an invertebrate, or a vertebrate looking at other invertebrates, or if you reach a certain point in your development or trajectory where you require obscene amounts of ice cream, you'll be like my daughter who needs ice cream the size of her head right now. And so this, I know, is encoded in her DNA to some degree. But to understand why she needs so much ice cream and how developmental trajectories occur for the lineage specification of all the cells in our body, we normally think of studying it this way, DNA, RNA, protein. But what's amazing is in the last five, 10 years, this picture has become far more complicated. We know that information has many ED RNA intermediaries. We know that information can copy itself at each part of the central dogma. We know that our state information can flow backwards in the central dogma. And in our laboratory, we study a lot of epigenetic changes, so looking how the DNA is wired and rewired to turn genes on and off through epigenetic switches. But three years ago, we also published the first demonstration of what's called the epitranscriptome. We've actually found that there are over 100 types of modified RNA bases that collectively we've called the epitranscriptome, which represent this vast regulatory landscape behind RNA, just like the epigenome is for DNA. And of course, you have many types of variations of RNA, uh, RNA that become protein and protein modifications as well. And amazingly, these marks are heritable. DNA epigenetic marks, even viral-induced microRNAs, and even prions can be passed between species. So the, the central dogma is much more complicated, really, than it used to be. But this is actually what I love. I love complexity. Because to look at the Kelly twins, we're going to be looking at all these layers of the physiology over the course of time. And what I think we are today, as geneticists, as biologists, as discoverers, is very much like what astronomers were in the 1600s, finding planets, or physicists in the early 1800s, 1900s, finding emission spectra. They were basically, for decades, collecting absorption and emission spectra for different atoms on the periodic table, but they didn't know what they were for a long time. But after a long enough time, we actually see that each atom on the periodic table has very particular absorption and emission frequency that you can see here that actually will tell you what is present, whether you're in atmosphere hundreds of millions of light years away or if you're a piece of mineral in a lab. And so what are we doing today? We're collecting emission spectra of human biology, of the cells that are in us, on us, and around us, because these emission spectra, as you've just heard, are not just from us. They are, of course, we have a lot of friends with us. We have a phalanx of friends in us, on us, and around us. 
So in the cellular democracy of your body, you're outnumbered about 10 to 1. So if there was a vote to see where you should go, you would never win the election. You'd probably just be rolling around on the ground most of the time because the bacteria want to go hang out with their friends. So you'd never, you'd never win. But, but these are our friends that are in us, on us, and around us. But most of them, it turns out, we don't actually know who they are. So we've launched a project called the Metagenomics of Subways and Urban Biomes to help have people basically help us swab subways around the world and also their cities to see just what's there. And why are we doing this? Well, because the first pilot data in New York City showed that actually half of the DNA of the things that we sequence didn't match any known organism. We don't know what they are. We've never seen them before. And it's, you know, but I think they're friendly, they're fine. Uh, and so, but this, it really is like a, looking at a rainforest. You see there's a vast amount of discovery left literally right under our fingertips when you take the subway to work. And even more interesting than that, what we love about these data is you can mine the data to look for what are called biosynthetic gene clusters. These essentially are small clusters of biochemical pathways that we've used to actually predict and discover new antibiotics literally on the railing of the New York City subway system. So this project is simultaneously a biological discovery mechanism and a drug discovery mechanism at the same time. So it's an exciting, just pure discovery effort because to really understand what happens to microbes, we'll need all these layers of biology, including what they're making and how they interface with human cells. And that gets to the second phase of the 500 plan is to think about the microbes and engineering them. And so why would you want to engineer microbes? That's the second point. Of course, you'll need beer. And so all of you like beer for a lot of different reasons. I have my reasons, you have yours. But really, they're engineered yeast and microbes that give you a particular flavor that you like. And my, actually, the tale about beer is really because I was excited when I visited the Guinness Brewery. And you can actually see that when Arthur Guinness signed a lease, it was a 9,000-year lease to brew beer on that site. And so short of disposal plans for nuclear waste. This is the longest human plan I've found actually so far. And so I was excited because clearly Arthur Guinness was not going to be around drinking beer for 9,000 years, but he thought beer was important enough and tasty enough that it should be enjoyed by humanity for at least 9,000 years. And so this idea of engineering microbes for their pleasure, for our pleasure, for their survival, is just really the tip of the iceberg because we'll need to think about them, engineer them, and not only do it for beer, but we've started to even do this in New York City. So the Gowanus Canal is a heavily polluted canal in New York City, but it's being remediated by the EPA. And as we're cleaning it up, we've actually also discovered new biosynthetic pathways that are absorbing toxins from the environment. So we're engineering the canal to make sure we maintain the good microbes and get rid of the bad ones, because they're really they're serving a, a wonderful purpose. We're engineering the microbes there for our benefit. And we're thinking about the same things for astronauts. Can we engineer the human microbiome skin to have more absorbent bacteria that could absorb some of the harmful radiation, or even the surfaces of the space station to absorb some of the, some of the radiation? And finally, you can think about not just engineering microbes, but really you can think of, if you think of engineering any biology, you can use it as a test of our understanding. So our understanding of biology is measured by our ability to engineer it and then predict the result. And so in particular, one thing that we're even doing recently is looking at gene drives, which are mechanisms to not only engineer microbes, but even other species, where you can actually have a propagating genetic element transform even an entire species, in this case, uh, of mosquitoes, so they can resist malaria. And so this, of course, is a really kind of a shocking concept and it raises a lot of ethical questions. But I think this is really leading towards what will have to be the third phase of the five-year plan, is this idea of mixing and matching DNA and actually getting much more comfortable with the idea of synthetic biology, genome engineering, sculpting evolution. And the idea is actually a bit like music. My first job out of high school was actually a DJ. So if you think about actually using a sampler to collect samples from songs and mix and match them together, it's actually like when you sequence DNA, you get a catalog of genetic elements that you can maybe mix and match together. And so to make a musical composition with a turntable is similar to do a genetic composition as sort of a genetic DJ. And so I think this is essentially what the last part of the plan is to think about engineering microbes, maybe other species, and potentially the human genome to go off and be on other planets. And so you might think, well, this is a nice metaphor. Music, I like it, it's interesting. But it's actually more than just a metaphor. So we've actually been working lately in the lab with what are called nanopore sequencers, which are only about this big. They fit in the palm of your hand and a small protein that has an aperture that's about the same diameter as DNA. And you can actually watch DNA as it moves through the pore. It creates an electrical current that actually looks, interestingly, like a sound wave. So we've actually modified the Shazam algorithm for matching music that you have in your phone, and we're able to match different species based literally on the sound wave of the music of the genetic composition as it comes through the pore. And so in this regard, DNA is literally like a music, and that means in all of you there is to some degree a genetic symphony that's playing right now, as long as you can hear it and have the right instrument. And so we've been using these uh, algorithms and playing with nanopores. We're also, I'm excited to tell you that we've, uh, this idea that you can only sequence on Earth is no longer true. So we just did a test uh, last, uh, last month and actually we showed that you can actually sequence in zero gravity for the first time. 
There are some complications, I will warn you, with sequencing in zero gravity. So uh, in particular, uh, pipette tips do not always stay where they're supposed to in zero gravity. <laughs> So this is a problem, thanks to Andy Feinberg, who's doing this pipetting. And so we found that uh, this is for the vomit comet of the parabolic flight simulator. We found that it's a little bit more challenging. But we did actually get three fragments of DNA that worked in zero gravity. So it's the first incidence we published of zero gravity sequencing. But we're going to have to work on the pipette tip situation for sure. <clears throat> so, so looking ahead, when we think about sending people to go live on other planets in preposterous 500-year plans, which is not, you know, not as long as, say, a 9,000-year beer plan, but to send people to live on other planets, we really have two options. You either send a whole bunch of people there and say, OK, go get there and evolve, which is kind of like the good luck plan for humans. <laughs> or we think about using our ingenuity and engineering our microbiome, our as different species, potentially the human genome, engineering different DNA repair mechanisms so they can actually survive in these far-flung planets. And I think we might have to. I think we have a duty to. Because if you think long, long, long term, what do we do as we explore and we expand, we go to different suns, eventually the universe will just keep expanding. You know, Chris, so what are you going to do then? Well, I think at that point we have the, a real ethical question, the final ethical question. Do we prevent the uh, implosion of the universe, or if it's going to continue to expand, do we reshape the universe, literally, to prevent it from happening? Because what if we're worried that life won't start anew in the next version of the universe? universe? I think that we actually have to. I think it's our duty to. Uh, I mean, essentially, if you think of a Kantian perspective from the categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant, it only applies if there's people left. If you think of uh, the Mill's utilitarianism, the greatest good for the greatest number, only applies if there's numbers left. And so I think evolution has finally self-actualized. Evolution has anthropomorphized and made a species that can direct its own evolution as well as that of other species. But I think this is a grave responsibility that we have to do, of course, carefully. But the time is happening and the time is here, and we may need to do it to go to these far-flung planets. But to do it, we'll need at least those three things. More knowledge of genomics. We'll need more knowledge of biology. We'll definitely need some more engineered microbes. Some of them will for sure be beer and ice cream, I think. And the third thing is we'll need more genetic DJs so we can listen to more genetic symphonies on more planets. I look forward to seeing you all at the concert. Thank you. <laughs>